And welcome back to coverage here of the Players Tours Finals. Marshall Cycliffe with Mani Davuti. Mani, good morning. How are things going? It's nice to see you. Good morning, Marshall. Things are going well. I've been enjoying watching the Magic so far, and we've got so many more insane matches today, so I'm just so excited. That's right. Today is day two of the tournament, and of course, this is where things really start getting heated up. Now, we're still early in the day here, so nobody's deciding their fate on top eight just yet. But as we work our way through the course of the day, you will see that the players are fighting for two big landmarks here. The first one is, of course, the top eight, which we'll be playing next weekend. So they're going to be scrapping it out and looking for that big top eight finish. But don't forget that the top 16 here also qualify for the grand finals, which will be coming up later this year and that's a big tournament to qualify for so there's two big hurdles coming up down the stretch now again at this point in the tournament the players are still kind of positioning themselves to try to get that big finish and we're going to see who's going to take a step closer as we mentioned we've got christopher larson versus raf levy they are in the feature match let's head on down right now All right, Monty, so we've got Raph Levy versus Christopher Larson. It's kind of funny because these are both two old school players, I, I think you could say. Like, Christopher has been playing since 2001, which puts him in the pretty, you know, grizzled veteran status here for Magic. But not compared to his opponent, Raphael Levy, been playing since 1994 in the Hall of Fame and in the MPL, still at the top of his game after all these years. And uh, they are off to the races now. Jun Sacrifice is the deck in the hands of Christopher Larson on the other side of the battlefield. Wow, blue, white, Yorian. And yeah, that's a companion Yorian as well, an 80 card deck here. What do you make of the matchup, Money? Uh, we've seen the blue, white against Jun matchup before M21 came out uh, at PT4 in the hands of Gabriel Nassif. In that match, it looked really nice for Nassif. Just had answers to all the things that Jun was putting out and having the ability to go on the aggressive with something like Archon of Sun's Grace and take over the game because the Jun deck doesn't really have many good answers for Archon, especially in the main game, was one of the reasons I really like the blue-white side of it. Since M21, Jun has changed a bit. We see Solemn Simulacrum in the deck now, so definitely some new elements, but I don't think it's changed enough to not give the edge to Raph. Double goose opener here for Christopher Larson, though we see Omen of the Sea now from Raph Levy as he surveys the scene, ultimately keeping an Ether Gust on top yeah. of the library. Raph's still thinking about it. I think it's reasonable. Part of the reason I think Raph is thinking about this is just really... Oh, it looks like we had a bit of a time skip there. Is oh, boy. Right? Uh, wow. Corvold Fakers King just have suddenly appeared along with about three other lands on the battlefield. Yeah, <laughs> not not sure what happened there with the feed, but it looks like we've zipped forward pretty significantly in the game here. And wow, all of a sudden the fireworks are hitting. There's a Corvold Fakers King and now Yori and Sky Nomad hitting the battlefield as well. We'll just try to play catch up here as we figure out what in the world just happened. But, uh, boy, the heavy hitters have arrived. <laughs> Korvold and Yorian now going at it toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Yeah, it looks like both players had the time to develop. And while Chris was able to get a lot of the things he wanted in the play, like Korvold, and judging by the four counters on it, drew a bunch of cards. All right, well, we're going to try to actually get it, uh, get it sorted here uh, just for a minute. So... <laughs> It looks like Teferi had his way with our board state there, Monty, and uh, sk skipped us ahead about five turns or something like that. Perhaps a sneak preview, but we're going to take a look and see if we can get it uh, back to, to where it was. Um, interesting to see, though, just as a snapshot, that it really was Yorian versus Korvold there. Bang, bang, the two big, uh, the big hitters for both decks going at it. It looks like we're kind of back now. I've got some predictions <laughs> for you, Monty. But yeah. it will be kind of interesting to see how things develop towards that board state that, that we know is coming. Yeah, I, this is actually really cool uh, in the sense that 
a lot of players, especially professional players, when they play covered matches, they like to go back and watch the replay of that match just to analyze their play. Uh, regardless of whether it was a win or a loss, the, you get a better sense of how things went, what you could have done differently, what could have been better, what could have been worse. And I think here we're also getting an idea now that we saw what the board got to. We can look at what is happening with a fresh set of eyes of, okay, how do we get from here to there? And what decisions did the players make to get us there? That's right. And, you know, if you've ever, you know, I know a lot of our, our audience is looking to improve at Magic, right? When they when they watch the stream, they want to see what the great new decks are, what the sweet technology is. But also watching pro players play lets you mimic them, right? You can say, well, oh, they did something that I wouldn't have done. And that's really interesting. If you've ever had a chance to watch yourself play, uh, like maybe you're playing on Arena and you record your screen and then, you know, go back the next day and just watch yourself play. It's horrifying. <laughs> it's just like you're looking at it like I did that. Why did I make that play? You know, and it, you realize how hard of a game it is when you're the one who's sitting in the seat and having to make uh, the decisions without the knowledge that you have in retrospect. Yeah, absolutely. And. Raf here getting the opportunity to put this Yorian in hand. I think part of the reason we saw him choose to bottom that Ether Gust was because he's looking for a second white source and more lands specifically to be able to cast this Shire to the Sky. But now the window is open for Chris Larson to land his Haymaker in the turn three Corvold. Super interesting setup to this game. And again, we kind of. Uh... <laughs> We're kind of walking you through uh, yeah. a scenario here. Uh, what are you seeing here, Monty? I, I, does, does Larson just go for it, sack both foods, leave himself kind of with nothing but, but have a Corvold on the, pl on the battlefield? Looks like no. I, I think I really like this choice from Larson of feeling like he's not really safe given the number of cards in Raph's hand and maybe wanting to ensure that he gets a bit more value from that Corvold before casting it. So going with a safer line of the Solemn to continue ramping and developing his board. Makes sense. Uh, you know, the, the food are a, a limited resource, right? It, it does matter how you manage those. That's one of the many things that you have to do when you're playing the Jun Sacrifice deck. There's a lot of different resources, triggers, uh, things like that that you need to manage. And one of them is food. Uh, you know, the deck is pretty good at making uh, food tokens. But, you know, when you really step back, it's it's rare that you see them with five or six food tokens just sitting on the battlefield. They do use them and therefore, you know, they're, they're valuable resource for them. Yeah, absolutely. Later on in the game, it can feel like the Jun deck, especially with a Witch's Oven out when that happens, it can feel like they don't have any shortage of food. But we have to remember that in the early game, Gilded Goose is not a traditional mana creature in that you can't use it every turn guaranteed. When you use that food token to create a mana, there's oftentimes the next turn you are down a mana because you don't have access to that food anymore. Right. I'm curious. So I wonder what Raf, what Raf's position is on this, because, you know, we did see five mana available on turn three, but then Larson went deep in the tank and ultimately played a solemn and passed. Raf has to be thinking, what could be going on over there? Yeah, absolutely. But something we have to remember is even though we can see both players' hands, uh, Chris Larson doesn't see the awkwardness that is happening in Raphael Levy's hand. All he has access to in the open deck list is the information about the cards that are in Raphael Levy's deck. And that gives Raph some bluff equity of being able to pretend he's stronger than he is, which is forcing Chris to make these plays that look subpar when we have full information. If Chris had just slammed Corvold on turn three, looking at Raph's hand, there's no answer to it, but Chris can't know that. Right. Yeah, this is super interesting. And, you know, the pieces of the puzzle are really coming together here for, for Larson, uh, regardless of the Corvold that we'll see shortly. Uh, Witch's Oven is now on the battlefield with things to start sacrificing. Of course, there is no cat 
to be seen, no trail of crumbs, but Mayhem Devil is there and could start throwing around some damage as well. So, you know, if I'm in Raft Seat, I'm starting to get a little nervous here that even without a Corvold in sight, there's some significant action happening on the other side. Yeah, absolutely. And you see Raft tanking here on using the Dovin's Veto because while there aren't that many great targets for the Veto in the John Sacrifice deck, there is a really important one in that Bolus' Citadel. A card that, when it comes down, sometimes you just don't give your opponent the opportunity to interact with it at uh, sorcery speed. You just kill them on the spot. And Raft was really tanky about whether he wanted to save that Veto for that. All right, so the sky gets shattered, but the, the fallback plan here for Larson does look pretty strong with Corvold. Yeah, Corvold able to come down, immediately sacrifice the food, and start rebuilding uh, Larson's position. Fortunately for Raph, because of that timely draw of the Castle Ardenvale, giving him an untapped white source, allowing him to cast Shatter that turn, that means this turn he's no longer playing a turn behind and is able to cast the Elspeth Conqueror's Death, targeting that Corvold. And now we can see how things uh, played out to get to the point that we were at, especially sitting in Raph Levy's seat where, okay, I've got the glass casket. I could use that on the Gilded Goose. I've got Yorian for next turn to, to blink all of it if I want. I've got Elspeth Conqueror's Death to kill the Corvold in a more permanent way this turn. So things looking pretty good here uh, from, Raph, from Raph Levy's perspective. Absolutely. And... What we're seeing in this game is really something that has always been true of control decks in Magic the Gathering, in that they carry a lot of uh, threat to them without having to actually play cards. Having cards in hand for control decks is something that other decks have to respect. And Chris didn't really feel under pressure because looking at his hand, he felt like he could go late. He had the tools in Corvold, in Witch's Oven, and Mayhem Devil to really continue putting on small bits of pressure and fight through answers from Wrath. But unfortunately, because of the way he chose to play this game and the pacing that he took it at, Wrath is now at the point where he's at 17 and he's already ECD'd one Corvold and has a Yorian to blink it, blink these omens, refill his hand and really put this game away. Yeah, you know, it, this does feel like one of those games where if you're the control player in Raph Seat this time, you feel like it's all just kind of lined up beautifully for you, right? It's like everything Christopher did, he he kind of flooded the board, sweep you, play your big, powerful Corvold, you know, one of the best cards in your deck, no problem, Elspeth conquers death, play another Corvold, Sure, no problem. I have the Yorian to get some really nasty value here, right? You know, blinking the three permanents that that Raph has is is going to be a windfall for him for sure. Yeah, and I believe this is almost the point we jumped to earlier, which yeah. is now this Corvold in play, this Wostrider in oh, play. Oh, man, and an untapped land here, Monty. Unbelievable. Yeah, that is really the knockout punch here as... This allows Raf to cast this glass casket before this Yorian and then blink all four permanents to essentially remove Chris's entire board. Yikes. Hey, this is the power of Yorian, right? Uh, you know, even even after the rules change around companions, you can still find a way to really abuse Yorian. And, you know, it's kind of funny because it makes you think about <laughs> when we got to just cast it as a companion straight up and well we saw what happened uh you know yorian ended up basically taking over standard in a few different forms but uh still just as powerful as it was if you can get it on the stack which we're going to see from from levy this turn yeah absolutely i think it is really demonstrating just how much the companion mechanic needed a change in that Having access to these effects for free is just much too strong. And even after you change it, there will be decks that still are willing to give up the cost to play these powerful, quote unquote, eighth cards in their starting hand. Now, the interesting dynamic here as well, though, Mani, is that as much as, as this has gone well for Levy, 
you know, Corvold is an amazing card in that it has that enter the battlefield trigger as well as that static ability. And Larson has been able to keep his hand full, and it's going to be even more so, um, you know, by the end of this turn. I mean, Chris is going to untap with, what, seven, probably eight mana, uh, three, six, sorry, excuse me, six or seven mana, and what, six or seven cards in hand? I mean... Oh, wow. Oh, and there's the Bolas' Citadel. Hello. Notably, I will say that Chris is under an ECD tax for this turn. So Bolas' Citadel actually costs eight, and Chris will not be able to cast it until the mm. next turn, giving Raph a window to try to find an answer to it. Now, it will also be the tax next turn, too, right? Oh, of course. Yeah. So this is a significantly delayed Bolas' Citadel. But Solemn Simulacrum is going to come down. That's an extra mana. And then it looks like a pair of Witches Ovens is kind of the last thing going. I'm assuming Claim the Firstborn is, is pretty much dead in this matchup. Claim the Firstborn isn't quite dead. Mm. Uh, the existence of it does mean that Raph has to be very mindful about the size of the shark tokens that he creates from Shark Typhoon. Mm. Because a large shark being stolen could just suddenly end the game from Larson's point of view if Raph isn't careful. Interesting. So uh, a niche, you know, a corner case scenario, but it could be an important one. By the way, here's another copy of Yorian Sky Nomad coming down after the first one attacked that looked like it was inevitable. And what are we going to see here? Definitely the, the ECD, the thing, and the thing. And is the glass casket worth doing? No, right? It's got a a Woe Strider or something underneath it? I don't believe so. And I want to highlight an interesting choice Raph made there in sacrificing the old Yorian to the uh, legend rule when he played the new one, rather than keeping it, allowing him to blink it with the new Yorian's trigger and essentially get a second round of that blink trigger. Uh, okay. This is... <laughs> I got to say, I can appreciate both players' approach to the game here. The value is flowing for both of them. Uh, you know, Christopher Larson threatening this bolus is, with this Bolas' Citadel to perhaps just get a huge blowout and uh, win the game on the spot. You know, one of the things that Raph's deck is not amazing at is uh, pressuring the life total of Larson. That kind of comes in big chunks later in the game through through flyers. But up until that point, here we go. Bolas' Citadel on the stack and on the battlefield. 12 life to play with. And let's see what happens from Larson. Can he have one of those insane Bolas' Citadel turns where he just goes off? I'm going to say probably not. Just because that ECD tax is still active. And there we see another land on top of Larson's deck in that top left corner. So stopped for the turn giving Raph a window to draw something like that and then use that to ferry to get that Bolas the Citadel off the board for good. So, yeah, you were right. The one-turn window there didn't get much for Larson. Found a land after the first card, and, uh, boy, Elspeth Conqueror's death, nasty. MVP of this game, without a doubt, getting to answer both those Corvals with one copy of the card, as well as tax this pulls the Citadel for multiple turns, ensuring that Raph has the time to set up the game like this, means that Larson just has no hope of coming back here. So we're going to see uh, Teferi Time Raveler hit the battlefield. That's going to send Bolas' Citadel back to hand, but now mystical dispute at the ready to counter it on the way back down and things have fully fallen apart for christopher larson that is raf levy picking up the first game now we're going to go to sideboards here and this blue white deck of course has a lot of wiggle room in the main deck given that it has 80 cards in it so usually sideboarding gets a little easier in the sense of well there's these that i don't want at all but raf still has to figure out what to actually bring in in the matchup what do, what do you like here that you can see on the screen the first thing we saw immediately come into the deck was Heliod's Intervention. It is one of the best cards in the format against this Jun Sacrifice deck because there aren't that many ways to answer multiple copies of an artifact or enchantment, which is where the power of this Jun deck comes from in Trail of Crumbs, in Witches of an and in Bolas' Citadel. Heliod's Intervention is the card that allows that to happen. 
Oh, that's such a great answer for Raph. And you can see the makeup of the build here. Even with just being two colors, blue, white, and 80 cards in the main, they really don't have to give up that much as far as power level goes. You know, okay, fine, there's a couple of Omen of the Sun or whatever, maybe not the most powerful card in standard, but it synergizes well with the deck. And as you can see, they just there's just enough really great cards in this color pair that you can get away with it without really feeling like the power level of your deck is is compromised that much. Of course, one thing to note about these type of decks, though, uh, Yorian specifically, is that they don't sideboard as well in the sense that, you know, you can bring in all the silver bullets you want, but you've still got 80 cards to try to churn through. You're less likely to see those silver bullets if you do have them. Yeah, and funnily enough, uh, the sideboard from Raph Levy here is a lot of silver bullets. Other than the two copies of Ether Gust and Sky Heather, every other card is a one of in the sideboard. Interesting. Hmm. Well, let's see. Uh, getting down to game number two here, Chris Larson. Boy, things looked good for him in game one. He got to resolve two copies of Corvold and a Bullis' Citadel. Those all hit the battlefield. Uh, if you just told me that, I would say he's 75% to have won the game or even higher. But no, it wasn't to be. Raph Levy able to counterpunch every single one of those threats and uh, ultimately take over. Thanks to, as you put it uh, before, Monty, thanks to uh, Elspeth Conker's death, ECD just dominated that game. Yeah, absolutely. And Larson, not off the greatest start with a mulligan to six here in the second game and not really holding much in the way of gas. And a little bit more uh, here from Christopher Larson with this duress to take away Omen of the Sea. But Larson, nothing going here. He's got a solemn simulacrum, but it's not even going to come down next turn. So... Chris has really got to hope that the top of his library is kind to him because he is not in a good position at this point. And it's Corvold, which that is going to come down on turn five, assuming that Solemn resolves. But um, boy, he's kind of all in on Corvold, isn't he? Yeah, a little bit. And we see the Shatter of the Sky already waiting in Raph's hand. We also see Archon of Sungrace gets picked up, so it's not even like Raph doesn't have any sort of development after the Shatter, as well as having access to something like Dovin's Veto, so potentially after this turn, Raph doesn't have to have the defenses down against some of the problem cards from Larson, like that Witch's Oven, like that Trail of Crumbs. Raph is just going to send the cat pack and back to hand here with Teferi Time Raveler, pass it back, but Christopher is just going to play Solemn Simulacrum. He actually drew a Blood Crypt anyway, so we will be seeing Corvold Faker's King next turn, most likely. Might the question is, idea. can Raph go punch for punch this time like he did in the first game? And based on the contents of his hand, I would say, yeah, he can. He, he kind of just has it all here. Yeah, this is really unfortunate for Raph. All of his plays that were made in the last two turns were without the knowledge of that Corvold because the Corvold was drawn later on in the game and Raph is trying to play a bit more aggressively because of his opponent's mulligan but the result is now Raph has a creature in play that he doesn't want to shatter away but will be forced to do so. Yeah that was really awkward there for Raph especially given the contents of his hand. I mean, he could have gone for Omen of the Sea, leave up Dovin's Veto, but that didn't seem like I, I kind of liked where he was at mentally by just slamming the Archon of Sun's Grace and ignoring the Shatter of the Sky. But unfortunately, as you mentioned, yeah, Corvold on the other side of the battlefield is just simply a must kill. You, you just cannot allow that card to stick around for even a turn. We've seen some, uh, you know, there's times when the, you know, like this, like Raph's at 14. And, you know, I see a Corvold, and admittedly, there's not a whole lot else going on on the side of Christopher, but I'm, al I'm already going, maybe he's dead? You know, <laughs> like, we've just seen Corvold be able to crack in for huge amounts of damage, and, uh, you know, especially in conjunction with some of the other tools that Christopher has uh, in the deck. Although it looks like this time Raph is going to take the risk here and just pass the turn back with his Archon of Sun's Grace, a pair of Omen of the Sea and a Dovin's Veto in hand. He does have the benefit of having plus the Teferi. So this Shatter the Sky is still live at instant speed. And mm -hmm. this now gives him the option of playing Omen of the Sea for blockers and going for something like a triple block on Corvold instead, feeling nice and safe 
that because Teferi is in play, uh, Chris won't be able to further grow it and mess with this, allowing Raph to essentially use free resources to get this Corval off the board. Can Continue guards and set up is, uh, is he going to lose the Archon in this exchange? He is going to lose the Archon, but okay. he was going to lose it anyways to that Shadow of the Sky. So right. Raph is feeling like this is the lesser of two evils, allowing him to resolve both these omens. Oh, wow. I love this from <laughs> Raph. Raph. going for maximum value. He's actually just going to chump block with one of the Pegasus and, then, uh, and, and try to keep this Archon alive for even longer. It's not just that, it's that he didn't have to put the shields down for some Dovin's veto. And we see that copy of Bolas' Citadel in Chris Larson's hand. Chris is sitting at 18. If Raph had just used the second omen there, and Chris goes, okay, post-combat, I play Bolas' Citadel and starts Don't going worry. off, I that could this. just be game losing for Raph, and he didn't take that risk. Wow. Raph playing very well here, maneuvering through what could be a pretty... Uh, Nasty situation for him, but no problem at all. He's just going over the top. Now, if he passes the turn here, he's really committing to that Shatter of the Sky, right? I'm not even sure if that's true. I think after the Corvold attacks, Raph still has the opportunity to use Omen of the Sea, create another chump blocker for Corvold, and let Teferi go down. Part of the reasoning being, again, Raph might not want to put this Dovin's Veto down, thinking about that Bolas' Citadel sitting in Chris's hand. Yeah, he has enough mana now, right? No, he's only got two white mana sources. Awkward. Yeah, and you see Raph thinking about it. He was first eyeing the Shadow of the Sky, now going for the Omen of the Sea. Right, the downside of, you know, to, to what Raph's doing is he is allowing Corvold to pick up a few triggers here, right? Of refilling Larson's hand a card Ooh. at a time. I think I know what Raph is doing here. He's putting okay. the Pegasus trigger on the stack and then casting Shatter of the Sky to succeed to leave himself with an extra <laughs> Pegasus after the Shatter. Max value. Now, this, does this open up the door, though, for Bolas' Citadel to go crazy? It does, unfortunately. And this is a really scary turn for Raph as Chris still has 15 life to work with after resolving that Bolas' Citadel here. Wow, so that was really interesting from Raph because he was definitely thinking, okay, now I can shatter plus veto because you saw him pull shatter out of his hand and then go, oh no, I actually can't do both. And he's adjusted his line beautifully, but it could backfire because that is Bolas' Citadel on the battlefield now for Larson. Can he go off from this juncture? He doesn't have any way to manipulate his library right now. No, and we see Larson really thinking about whether he wanted to shock in that stomping round off the top of the deck or put it into play tapped. Unfortunately, after a Gilded Goose, the next card is a Fabled Passage, so that's Larson being done for the turn, which once again gives Raph the window to bounce that Bolas to Citadel with Teferi Ooh. or just get rid of it with ECD. <laughs> nice, uh, nice change of course, change of direction there, Monty, as we see Elspeth conquers death right off the top of the library there. For Raph Levy with a pair of Yorian in hand as well. You gotta feel like he's feeling he's like he's in a great position now that he dodged that big turn from Bolas' Citadel. Two lands on the top of the library there for Larson. Rough stuff. He really needed to be able to go. Now, the Jun Sacrifice deck, generally speaking, has a lot of really good ways to manipulate the top of their library to keep the Bolas' Citadel going and usually win the game on that turn. But unfortunately for Larson, the Trail of Crumbs was in hand and that tapped him out to be able to use all of his mana. So the double land on top really was a stop sign for the, uh, the Citadel. And now Raph Levy with a great answer in hand. Yeah, I would actually love to see Raph go minus Teferi on the Bulls of Citadel rather than cast the ECD and then play a Yorian from hand, allowing him to blink these omens and the Teferi getting some new cards, as well as keep up Dovin's Veto, forcing Chris Larson to use six mana to recast the Bulls of Citadel on his turn. Yeah, that's beautiful line of play, Mani, as if you can convince Chris to do that, 
for the most part, that would be his entire turn, and uh, you would almost guarantee getting the turn pass back to you again when you were already in an advantageous position. It's it's just uh, kind of piling on the value at this point. Let's see the line that Raf ends up taking here, but I love your line for sure, and looks like Raf agrees with you, Monty. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is the perfect line of play from him. And the biggest reason for it, not even just that everything lines up so well, is that suddenly with Yorian in play, you have six power worth of flying, and your opponent has a Gilded Goose in play, but they're 10 life. They're going to die really quickly. Oh, yeah. This is a very quick clock. Like, quick enough that if Christopher says, all right, I got to go for Bullets to Citadel, and, and that may be the only real option for Chris, if that's the case, it could just be the nails in the coffin here because that pressure in the air is big. And again, if Chris doesn't really do much else for the turn outside of tap a bunch of mana for Citadel, that could put him woefully behind on board and uh, really just can't take the tempo loss at this point. Yeah, and unfortunately, we know Chris's top guard is a Fabled Passage. I wouldn't be surprised to see him have an upkeep stop set to sacrifice a food to that Cauldron Familiar just to activate Trail of Crumbs and give himself an extra shot at a live draw here. And that's exactly what we're going to see, Monty. Great call there. Trail of Crumbs, bada bing. And let's see if Larson can find something... Other than Bolus' Citadel, what would be the best draw? Corvold or something along those lines? Honestly, I'm not sure if there is a best draw for Larsa at this point facing down this board. Mm. The Bolus' Citadel is probably the strongest card, and looking at the line from Raph, Larsa cannot feel confident that this is going to resolve here. Yeah, it's really a tough spot here for Larson because even feeling like, oh, you def or actually, sorry, not feeling, knowing that, that Raph has a Dovin's Veto, w what do you do? You just play Solemn Simulacrum, Gilded Goose, and say, go? This is just a terrible spot for, for Larson. I think Larson's best hope here may be sacrificing the food to try to activate Trail of Crumbs and okay. find something that's a creature. Okay, there's a Woe Strider. It's not ideal, but that it's ain't something. It, is it? Yeah. This flying force from Raph is just so scary in Larson's current position. Larson with Gilded Goose, which will make a food and also provide a chump locker to get in the way of Yorian for a turn, perhaps. Yeah, and Larson is really feeling the pressure here as well because he's now not really presenting any sort of pressure from himself and he's under what is the Teferi Yorian quote-unquote lock of Teferi mm -hmm. can minus on Yorian, return it to your hand, goes to one loyalty, but you replay Yorian and blink the Teferi back to four and with those omens, each time you do it, you're further developing your hand and your draws and just putting the game out of reach for your opponent. And that does seem to be exactly where we're at here in round number nine. If you're sitting in Christopher Larson's seat, this one may well have fallen apart. Six and two is Chris's record. Same thing as Raph Levy and uh, Raph in full control here, really cruising to the finish. Uh, game one and then game two actually ended up lining up well for Raph. Uh, too. So this is, um, yeah, a tough spot here for Larson. It just doesn't really seem to be any reasonable way out of this. Yeah, definitely a rough morning for Christopher Larson. Came into the day at 6-1, picked up a loss to Dominic Gertzen in the first round, and not looking good in this match either. So hopefully some recovery from him after this round as he is still positioned to make a deep run in this tournament. Going to have to uh, shake off those early losses. It can be a tough thing to do mentally, but Larson is a, a longtime tournament pro, so I don't think it'll be a big issue for him. Yeah, Chris Larson, I've known him for quite a while now. He is a very cool and calm player. I don't think he's going to be over to overly tilted from these early losses. It's just going to be a matter of, all right, it happens. I face some tough matchups, shake it off, move on. That's right. And that is the mentality you have to have as these tournaments, they're long. I mean, we're, this is this is day two. We're, we're a couple of hours in already. And the players are really just getting started for the day. So keep that in mind when, when you're watching them play. You know, a lot of us 
pop in on the chat and we've kind of had a, a bit of our day or whatever. Well, these players have been playing all day yesterday and, and all day today so far as well. And it can really add up. But as you mentioned, Larson's a cool customer and uh, I think he'll be able to shake it off pretty easily. But this one really out of hand at this point in favor of Raph Levy. Yeah, and some players at home may be looking at this event and thinking, oh, seven rounds each day, that's not so bad. Thinking about PTQs and Grand Prix played in the past where you could have nine to ten rounds on a day. But when you're playing seven rounds of Magic against the very best in the world, when your opponents each round are oh, MPL players, Hall of Famers, cool. people in the Rivals League, and Grand Prix champions, it's just so much more taxing to be playing these tough games of Magic with so much on the line against the best in the world. That's right, and it's a really good point that you bring up. We started yesterday with 145 players. We're down to 74 here on day number two, but the level of play is very, very high. Um, you know, this was like a condensed version of what you would see at a paper Mythic Championship, for example, where you have kind of a group of top-tier players uh, going from MPL rivals, and then the people that are just outside of that or that have been in that circle before and then at a normal mythic championship you'll combine that with a bunch of qualifiers that had won local events you know pro uh, excuse me mythic championship qualifiers or qualified through um you know other other paper means like grand prix and su such this one isn't like that um this is names upon names upon names just kind of up and down the board uh and it's a very compact field at this point with only 74 players but i'm telling you if you follow professional level magic go take a look at the list of players left and you're going to be like i know most of those names like the vast majority of those names and that's not necessarily the case at a, at a, at a you know mythic paper event or something so this is really a, a big game uh, for sure for these players having to face top tier competition round after round after round absolutely and in this game, Chris Larson is still putting up a fight, but now that he's tapped down to a point where he can no longer cast Bolus the Citadel for this turn, Raph feels safe to tap out of this Dovin's Veto and use an Aether Gust on Hat Mayhem Devil just to ensure that Chris isn't able to cobble together some sort of last ditch effort to put up a fight and steal this game from under Raph's clutches. Larson doing the best he can, firing off that Mayhem Devil, but getting it gusted. His life total is definitely a concern at this point. Six power in the air. And, you know, I will note here the subtle plays from Raph Levy paying off. That clever little play where he put the Archon trigger on the stack and then thanks to Teferi's plus ability, fired off the Shatter of the Sky at instant speed, wiped the board, and then got the 2-2. That could matter big time here. I mean, he is applying more pressure right now. He has, well... A two-turn clock as it sits, though, uh, you know, food can certainly mess up that math. But, uh, you know, those little plays can really add up, uh, especially, you know, it was a really cool little play he made there, too. Yeah, and I believe something that really matters is that play ended up giving Raph something like six or eight extra damage to the face, which is part of why he's able to have Larson in this position. I would love to see Raph bounce the Witch's Oven here with those two copies of Dovin's Veto in hand because that is what would allow Chris to gain life here and not die on the next turn given the information Raph has about his hand so far. <clears throat> yeah, I love this line from Raph Levy. You mentioned it. It's, it's, you know, I, I don't know how to describe it exactly. A lock, a soft lock, or maybe a hard lock. But this Yorian sequence that you can do when it comes to uh, Teferi Time Raveler plus Yorian, uh, you know, bounce. Your, you, you described it a minute ago, but basically bouncing the Yorian and then bringing it back to reset the loyalty and being able to continue to do this turn after turn. You don't need much else going on to make that a valuable uh, sequence and with two copies of Omen of the Sea, it's absurd. I mean, you're just you're drawing two extra cards and getting the card selection as well. 
um, as untapping your Yorian for whatever that's worth. So, you know, really, really powerful stuff here from Raf Levy. And it feels like the type of pressure that Christopher Larson can't take. Yeah, Christopher Larson is in theory not dead here it's still possible to make a food with your gilded goose sack that up to six life and have the gilded goose as a flying blocker for those creatures uh however we do see teferi on the battlefield ready to bounce it so chris larson has to decide how much mana he wants to use here to ensure his survival does he just ask this bulls the citadel and hope he can somehow mise the victory or is his plan to create a second food token but he won't have enough mana to eat them both here here's mayhem devil actually resolving so that's a step in the right direction for christopher larson yeah and I believe Chris has just left himself dead on board, actually. I won't let you win. Just has no, he? Now that, uh, now that Raf allowed that damage from the Cauldron Familiar to go through, what Chris can do is eat that food token, deal another damage to Teferi, which won't allow it to bounce that uh, Gilded Goose out of the way. But that Glass Casket should do it. Mm, okay. Yeah, there is a food token for Larson. I guess he could go up to six. Yeah, but that's six power in play. And right. I think this glass casket will end this game for Wrath Levy. Yeah, I don't know if you can put nails into a glass casket, but this is definitely the nails in the coffin here for Christopher Larson. He fought a good fight, but couldn't quite get the job done. And it is going to be... Raf Levy picking up the win here and improving his record to seven and two, perhaps marching towards another uh, top eight. Still a lot of rounds to play in the day, so we won't know yet, but a convincing victory there uh, for Raf, Mani. What stood out to you from the match uh, about Raf's build and, and how he played? I think that was just really systematic. Uh, from Raf, he dismantled uh, Chris's game plan, just fully understanding the cards that mattered, where he was strong, where he was weak, and what windows he had to take advantage of to make sure he got the most value out of every card. Yeah, and boy, <laughs> you know, both of those decks have that capability of sort of avalanching on value when they get going, and we did really get to see that from Raf Levy's side. Impressive stuff for him. Picks up another win with the blue-white Yorian deck, and we'll see if he can continue his rampage through the tournament. For now, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, we'll have more action here from round nine. Don't go anywhere. And this one has really started to fall apart for Jean Emmanuel. What does a comeback look like here? Well, we're going to see a big turn for him, too, because he has that same combination of Wilderness Reclamation and Expansion. Now, how the players each choose to utilize their mana is not obvious to me. Oh, but I see. But Depra will, will certainly play Wilderness Reclamation here and will certainly have access to at least nine mana on his end step. He floated all the mana here. But as you said, he has the expansion explosion that he can fire off kind of at his leisure almost because Shark Typhoon means that he's not taking damage from the shark. He also got the three life off of Uro there and is back up to six. Boy, yeah. Because you ask yourself, like, is it going to get any better for me if I wait? John Emanuel's going to kick it off with a growth spiral. Must find a way to interact with this spell on the stack or it's over. There it is. Grow spiral. He so finds a mountain. Play a land and cycle the shark typhoon for one more shot at negate or ether gust. That's it. That's exactly where we're at. Here we go. Shark typhoon cycle. Try to hit something. X equals zero. It's mystical dispute. Oh, not the one that Jean Emmanuel needed. All Murray has to do is pay for it, and he will be your champion. There it goes. Players to our online goes to Ryuji Murray.
Wow, we are actually underway here in game number two. Wow, these guys are playing very quickly. Hello. Lightning Strike is going to take down a Dauntless Bodyguard. Has to be done in the main phase because the Tithe Taker would cost three on his opponent's turn. Get to Lava Runner holding off Tithe Taker. But Alish Marshall is going to say, actually, let's not hold back anything. Tithe Taker into the red zone for Mangucci. Ooh, he doesn't hand. like that attack. Look at him. Look at this hand. Three Wizards Lightning, and he has a Wizard out. So they basically Lightning Bolt. Three copies of Lightning Bolt. I don't know if you saw that, but Mangucci, I think he regretted that attack. He didn't like it. He shook his head after he did it. No cards in hand for Glugowski, so there's no threat on the other side. I, you know, all the information is known for Mangucci. He just needs to decide what he feels like his best mode of attack is, and it looks like it's going to be Venerated locks it on, just trading off. The solid block there, double block. You only lose one of your creature. Trade one for one. That's right. He's down to three, facing down a huge board state, and there are no cards in mono red. They can get Piotr Glugowski back. This was Andrea Mangucci's day. He wow. has not taken a loss today, absolutely crushing his opponents all the way through the top four. He did not lose a single time. Keep your eye on Andrea Mangucci. He knows that he is on the verge of winning. It's a pass back. All he has to do is click attack with all of his creatures, and we will have our Mythic Invitational winner. It is... Andrea Mangucci, congratulations, Andrea. You are the winner of $250,000 and the Mythic Invitational. Well played all week. All week, well played by Andrea Mangucci. And welcome back to coverage here of the Players Tours Finals. Marshall Sutcliffe with Monty Davuti, and we are all set for more action here from round number nine. We've got Piotr Glugowski versus Riku Kumagai. Let's head down and uh, we'll get you acquainted when we get into the match. So, down in the future match, Riku Kumagai. Yeah, that's right. Mono Black Aggro with somehow no copies of Rotting Registor. I'm still getting my head around that. I think I had a nightmare about it last night. <laughs> On the other side is Piotr Glagowski. We're going to be riding along with him. Good old Canister there, and Canister's running four-color Reclamation. Yeah, whether he's the hero in your eyes or whether he's the villain, Canister is the player that we've just seen so much of in the past couple of years. Just a dominant breaking out on the pro scene and result after result after result from him. He's the villain, by the way. No doubt about it. <laughs> <laughs> He, he's the villain who, who comes with the emotes ready to go and will not let you off the hook. It looks like a mulligan to five here, though, from Riku. Both of these players are in fantastic position. Seven and one coming into the round after a fantastic day one and a good start to day two for both of these players. So this is a rough one, though, for Kumagai. Of going down to five with this mono black deck. Ouch. Yeah, and this five isn't even very good. It does have the double kite cell freebooter for disruption if he's able to find that second land, but if he hits too many lands here, he won't be put, putting on too much pressure. If he hits too few, he won't be casting anything. Whew. Got one, though. Swamp off the top of the library means that freebooter gets to come down. It's going to be growth spiral in response here from Glagovsky, but uh, now Kumagai gets free reign here to take whatever, and there's some nice stuff. Another spiral, expansion explosion, and a Nissa. Yeah, I would guess that we're going to see Kumagai take the Nissa here, as it is the only must-answer card in that hand. And if Kumagai finds a land next turn, he would really like to cast this Hunted Nightmare and not have to worry about that Nissa. Okay, there we go. These first few turns are going to determine who wins this game. Can Kumagai keep finding lands? Or is it going to fall apart off of a mulligan to five? We see the value train getting ready to leave the station here for Pyotr Gagowski. Uro hits the battlefield, if only temporarily. And there's a land off the top of the library. Kitesail Freebooter gets to get in there. But now we could see some real pressure here from Riku Kumagai. A four five for just three mana on the battlefield, ready to start slamming. Yeah, Glugowski's hand was really shaping up to be extremely awkward. I think we may see him actually cast a Growth Spiral and expansion it here just to draw some more cards because those last two expansion draws have been really hurting his game plan.
Oh, and this is going to be really bro brutal for Pewter as now Kumagai has access to t Timoret, something that Pewter was definitely hoping for as we see him constantly eye his graveyard is he was about to put two more cards in that graveyard and put him one card away from Uro. But now with that access to four mana, Riku can just play Timoret and remove the Uro from the graveyard, making it a non-issue and putting Pewter further behind in this game. Yeah, super rough here as Klagowski flooded on expansion explosions triple in hand right now and with Kumagai on a mulligan to five but actually finding the land drops that he needed to make this work now considering firing off this uh this Timoret yeah, Kumagai has really just hit the perfect draw steps in Lance to curve out this hand and really neutralize any threat coming from Pyotr as now he just has nothing going for him. You see Kumagai respecting a possible shark token here by not attacking with the Freebooter, but uh, the Nightmare is going to get in there. Now we're going to see growth spiral at what point is riku compelled to fire off the timoret is it just do it now because you know what you're going to do anyway i believe that he can wait uh for pyotr to play one more card that would go to the graveyard even if it's something like fabled passage kumagai would still be able to respond but doing it now to tap out and save some time is also respectable considering he's not really repping anything Right, it's, it's kind of what he was going to do. He does have a Heartless Act in hand, interestingly, as we see Kenrith go into hand here for, uh, for Canister. Yeah, normally we wouldn't consider Heartless Act an incredible card against a deck like Teamer or Four Color Reclamation, but when we think about how Kumagai is going to be losing this game with an aggressive start, it's Pyotr being able to stabilize the board with something like Kenrith or Shark Typhoon or Uro, and Heartless Act answers all of those and gets them off the board. Here, Pyotr may be feeling behind enough to just slam this Kenrith and hope it's able to take the game over, but if he was to do that, he would get heavily punished for it. Yeah, it's actually a really interesting scenario because if he runs it out here, he will definitely lose it. But if he chooses to wait and can actually manage to find a couple of more lands, Kenrith kind of comes with built-in protection from Heartless Act if you have a one a green available extra because you can put a counter on it, right? Yeah, absolutely. In the past, when we've seen Kenrith played in Standard in the Jeskai Fires decks of old, the green ability was the least activated one. We saw some decks splashing black mana to activate the black reanimation ability, but here, this team of Reclamation deck and for this four color Reclamation deck is really able to take full advantage of the huge amounts of mana it can generate with Wilderness Reclamation and just grow your creatures using that green ability. That's right. Now that's not going to be relevant at this point because Heartless Act was just used to kill the shark token. And critically, Riku Kumagai has Murderous Rider in hand now as well. So he actually does have the base covered on Kenrith hitting the battlefield. Yeah, and he also has nine power in place, so he has the bases covered for this. Sorry, that's only eight power. We're okay. We're okay. So close. He's only one power away from winning this thing. Oh boy, it's really going to set the stage here because realistically, right, Glagowski doesn't have ways to, to kill this many creatures in one shot, right? No, there's no board wipes in Glagowski's main deck. So even though that wasn't lethal and even though Glagowski does draw the Wilderness Reclamation here, I don't think there's any way for him to remove creatures using what is essentially eight mana. Man, Riku Kumagai somehow finding the game one win off of a mulligan to five. And it wasn't even a particularly aggressive curve out. You know, sometimes when you see a mulligan like that, you think, well, if I can go like one drop, two drop, three drop, and then like play something else after that, I might be able to just overwhelm my opponent if they stumble or if they have a little bit of a slow draw. But this wasn't the case. He Kumagai kind of played to his core game plan of disrupting you with creatures, uh, you know, particularly the Kite Sail Freebooter being important there. And, uh, and then just... Finishing the game with powerful three and four mana creatures like uh, the the horror that we saw there. Really impressive. I, I'm, wow, <laughs> mulligan to five and, and a pretty clean win there for Kumagai. Yeah, absolutely. Canister just stumbled a little and Kumagai took full advantage of that. And something that's really interesting, whether it's an intentional choice or not, I can't say. But here we see in sideboarding, Canister 
the removal suite that he's packing, Justice Strike Times 2, Solar Blaze, Definite Clarion, something that's really cool is Justice Strike and Solar Blaze really good against Rotting Regisaur don't do anything against Hunted Nightmare. So this deck building choice from Kumagai could end up being really punishing for Canister as his threats just line up so well against Canister's removal. <laughs> Crazy. I mean, that is the reason to play a deck like the mono black deck that we see here, right? Like I, I would consider this to be a metagame call rather than just like a raw power deck. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I definitely think that this is Riku saying, I want to try to beat up on these more greedy decks. Something that is really cool about his list is he's packing three copies of Duress in the main deck just to be able to try to get turn one growth spirals out of hand, just to be able to get those expansion explosions, those world reclamations, and be more mana efficient than Agonizing Remorse. So yes, he's an aggressive deck, but he's not cutting down on the interaction gonna have his cake and eat it too and game number two is upon us this is the type of curve that i think he wanted to see more of knight of the ebon legion to kick things off and now it looks like he's got a little bit of disruption here with an agonizing remorse yeah and getting to look at pewter's hand getting to know that there isn't much going on right now uh kumagai has to be feeling really good about his position right now yeah, you know, a follow-up aggressive card of the two or three mana variety would be so beautiful for Riku next turn. As it stands, that's not what's going to happen, but, you know, the top of the library could, could, could bring something good here. Yeah, absolutely. And fortunately, one of the beautiful things about Ooh. a card like Knight of the Ebon Legion, <laughs> as Glass Casket gets drawn, and Brutal. it's no longer relevant. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like Canister just interrupted your point right out of the stream there. <laughs> it's just like, you know, I'll, I'll let you save that one, Monty, for a little later, because I'm just going to top deck a glass casket and you're not going to have to worry about it. Well, Kumagai kind of got the wish that I was hoping for for him, but unfortunately, it was really not the most aggressive option. It was a murderous rider. Yeah, definitely not the three drop that Kumagai is looking for there, but considering it does still allow him to have a curve, I think he'll take it as now Rankle is going to come down and this card is really devastating for these slower control decks. Each turn it stays in play. So are, are we going to see the discard be used here by uh, Riku Kumagai to start tearing apart the hand from Glagovsky? He does know two of the three cards. The one he doesn't know is Uro, <laughs> which is certainly relevant when you're having your opponent discard cards. Yeah, absolutely. I think Kumagai does not want to draw more cards here as he has the card advantage he needs in that castle lock terrain. Giving more cards to Pyotr's deck is really scary, especially when that Wilderness Proclamation is already in play. And he, Kumagai knows that even if Pyotr discards an Uro here as that last unknown card, he's still holding that Heartless Act to be able to answer it. And this game is just not getting better for Pyotr if Kumagai is attacking his hand. Wow, I, I am so impressed by this, uh, the deck and the play here from Riku Kumagai coming in to the round and uh, really just kind of putting it to these reclamation decks with mono black. I love it. Yeah, really sharp play from Riku. And we see a fortunate pickup for Canister in that Brazen Borrower. This would allow him to ambush this Rankle and try to trade with it. But I'm not sure if that's going to work as Kumagai does still have that copy of Heartless Act in his hand. That's right. And it looks like that's exactly what Canister is going for. Going to run out the Brazen Borrower here just as the 3-1 Flyer. But as you mentioned, Heartless Act can shoot it down and that would be another five damage and another trigger from Rankle. And take a look at the hand from Kumagai. He's got two one drops and he could uh, deploy both of those this turn as well. This is just hammer time here for Riku Kumagai. Super impressive. Yeah, and he knows the canister is hellbent right now. No cards left in the hand, just the Uro in the graveyard. There are enough cards to get it back. And yeah, love this from Kumagai. Just chooses to not use any ability on Rankle, not let canister come back into this game. That's right. Just slamming the door on this thing. The Knight of the Ebon Legion picks up a counter on top of all the other things that Kumagai did. Down to 12 goes Glagowski, and it is in Uro we trust. This is really the last chance now 
for Klugowski. has got to find some action, and it's another land off of the Uro. Yeah, and because of Ranko, we know this Uro is not going to stick around. We expect it will get sacrificed this turn, even though Gl Kumagai can still all-out attack with his board. Canister realizes he needs to save life and can't really bluff anything anyways here, so just plays the Hallowed Fountain and says, all right, do your worst. And I think that Kumagai is going to oblige here. Kite Seal Freebooter off the top. Yeah, for Kumagai, he's really just thinking about, do I want to all-out attack this turn, or do I want to just attack with Rankle, get rid of this Uro, and pass the turn, save the all-out attack for next turn? Riku's just doing math here. The, uh, the Rankle attack is basically obligatory and then just seeing basically if you if, if i get rid of this uro with only the attack from rankle can i kill you the next turn or is it worth it to throw say the knight of the ebon legion into the mix here as well and lose that card for the extra four damage that i can get from the other two creatures yeah, attacking with just Rankle would still allow Riku to have lethal for the next turn should Canister draw nothing. But I think this is just a bit safer, still getting the trade gear if he wants. I don't actually think he should activate this Knight of the Ebon Legion, but goes for it anyways. He would have been able to draw a card with Castle Lockthrain and use Rankle to get rid of the arrow. However, that would cost him a creature of his own and maybe wouldn't give him lethal next turn that way. Oh, okay. And that's a Triumph off the top, but that of course can be cycled and it must be here. Pyotr Glugowski facing down Kumagai and that's gonna do it. Two games to zero for Riku Kumagai with mono black defeating Pyotr Glugowski in impressive fashion. Really great stuff from Kumagai and of course, as we work our way through the rest of the tournament, considering that he's at, you know, near the top, we're going to be keeping an eye on him and seeing how things go. That's going to do it for this round of coverage. Monty, thanks so much for doing such great work with me. That was a fun round. We are going to take a short break. When we come back, we'll have more. Don't go anywhere. Cry of the Carnarium. Do you counter this? I don't think so. Great. You just let it happen? You have a... You have a 3-3. Three, three. It you is a 3-3 three, 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 yeah, yeah, You can just let it happen. Well, it's three damage in. Again, the Terramander cannot be adapted. It already has a plus one, plus one counter on it. I don't think you can block here. If you block, you are not giving yourself the best shot at winning, I think. If you're in a Kawa seat, you think you just have to hold your breath yeah. and take the three here? And yeah, it's a random card for Burchett. If that's, you know, the, mm -hmm. hard, the hard counter that loses you the game, so be it. But Birch, oh my goodness, it was wow, a hard counter. It actually counter. is the hard Look counter that's going to lose that a couple hand. of the game. <laughs> Two Wizards retorts and a Spell Pierce. Ikawa can still chump block this turn. Right. But chump blocking is unlikely to, to win him the game here. Is there anything good under there, or is Autumn Burchett your first Mythic Championship winner? That's just from a dive England. down. He missed. he missed. He effectively missed here. Autumn Burchett is simply looking on and saying, what do you want to do, Ikawa? Because they know in hand are a pair of Wizards retorts and an effectively unbeatable situation for Autumn Burchett. This is incredible stuff down the stretch here as Ikawa tries to figure out if there's any possible way for him to get out of this, but there isn't. Beautiful, beautiful sequencing, prioritization, really valuing what is important here. And there's Kaya's Wrath. That is going to be met with a counter spell. And is this going to be it? Are we going to see the hand get extended? This is it. Counter spell number two for Autumn Burchett. And England has a Mythic Championship winner, and it's Autumn Burchett. Hey everybody, welcome back to coverage of the Players Tour Finals here on Day 2. I'm Maria Bartholdi, joined by Cedric Phillips and Riley Knight at our virtual news desk. And Cedric, you want to talk Raphael Levy. I do. Uh, I hope Raph doesn't take this the wrong way, but the old man still got a few tricks. 
Warriors left in the bag. Playing as Aureus Control with Uranus as companion, big deck, uh, and putting together a lot of wins. Just took care of Christopher Larson. Uh, and rumor has it that Riley Knight, you got to talk to your old pal there too, Ref, I think. Yeah, I did, as a matter of fact. And uh, I can I can let you know around for what, what was going on around the traps. I'm more than happy to uh, to fill you in for some of the latest goss from the uh, the, the quote-unquote tournament floor here. And Raph, made of mind, someone I caught up with. And uh, Cedric, you did characterize this matchup as being tricky, right? You said white-blue control was, uh, was going to have a hard time against Jund. And uh, I'll tell you what, Raph disagrees. He says that it's actually really hard for Jund to beat Azorius. And of course, that was reflected in the win that we saw there. But, you know, Raph, you know, I mean, I've been keeping in touch with him throughout the day. I actually asked him about his sort of his rhythm, his routine. He's been playing for a long time, uh, of, of course. He's uh, recently, in the last couple of years, gotten married, had a kid as well. So stuff's kind of changed for him. But playing at home, he said he's still staying very relaxed, staying very chilled out between the rounds, drinking plenty of water. This is a bloke who is in peak physical condition as a, as a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu brown belt, and of course, training for a marathon here as well. And as someone who has shared a ho many a hotel room with you, I can tell you, he knows how to relax. When this bloke doesn't want to think or do anything, he doesn't. He sleeps like this, like a vampire, and I can just imagine him sitting there in, com in his computer chair, completely zoned out to the rest of the world between the rounds, making sure that he keeps his mind nice and fresh. So uh, best of luck to you, Raph, of course, uh, and, and very well done so far. Now the Hall of Famer got the chance to catch up with Lee Shi Chan, who went 1-3 against Rec yesterday, and has turned that around to go 2-0 against Rec today. He said he's enjoying the advantages offered when uh, playing against uh, the, the Rec decks that are tuned to beat each other, right? Because he's playing at Rec to Sacrifice, although he still says the matchup is a bad one. And at six and three, he's not doing too badly for someone who has, you know, a self-admitted bad matchup against the best deck in the field. So good on your LST there, mate, and uh, best of luck to you in the, re in, the, in, the, in the coming rounds. And finally, I want to talk to you about a young German gun named Arne Huschenbert, who is out of Berlin, good friend of, uh, of Toral Toffel Severins, of course. And uh, he's been crushing for a long time in the European circuit, and he's, uh, at the, uh, currently he is six and three with Team Arek. Very happy with his deck choice and its two main uh, main decks, Chemister's Insights, although uh, he also sees being bring a lot of sharks and spirals. Um, and I asked him about playing through the Wreck Mirror so many times. He had some really good perspective, which I want to share with you. And here's a bit of advice for you if you want to go and, uh, and crush the team of Wreck Mirror. He said, when on the draw, you want to play very conservatively. And when on the play, you want to play aggressively. You need to know when to shift your role. That's very important. And also just, you know, draw as many brazen borrowers as, as possible that also certainly <laughs> certainly can help so that's that's the latest from the floor uh, at the moment it was uh, it was good maria to get a chance to catch up with uh, with players of all different types of all different records you know what it's good to know that even the pros here in a high level tournament like this still trying to figure out who's the beatdown uh, metric we use uh, to help us get better early on in our days of learning magic. Some other results from around the tournament floor, Christoph Prince, who's been leading this tournament almost since the get-go, faced Dominic Gertz in last round, and Prince remains undefeated. He is now 9-0, and oh, Dominic Gertzen falling to 7-2, and two, though certainly still in good shape. Seth Manfield was also a winner last round over Sebastian Pozzo. Manfield now at 7-2. and two. Abe Corrigan, you've been following this guy, Cedric. He won last round over Bernardo Torres, 7-2. and two. And I've been keeping my eye on Ken Yukihiro, bringing that cool Esper mid-range deck. He did not fare so well last round. He lost to Pro Tour champion Yvonne Flock. Uh, so Ken Yukihiro falling to 6-3. and three. Alan Wu also leading our leaderboard. Last round uh, falls to 7-2. and two. Pascal Vieran actually beat him last round as well. Well, before we get into round number 10 here, we've got some fun content for you. We've got another archetype breakdown. And then Marshall Sutcliffe is going to sit down with Matt Sperling to talk about his collection. Welcome to the Players Tour Finals Archetype Overview. Let's take a look at Blue-Green Based Ramp. Now, there are various flavors of Blue-Green Ramp decks, but all of them have the same goal. Build up an early mana advantage and use that mana to power out massive haymakers. All blue-green ramp decks are quickly trying to ramp into powerful cards such as Nissa who shakes the world and Ugin the spirit dragon. The various band builds typically forego some number of ramp spells in order to include cards like Teferi Time Raveler and Shatter the Sky to give them a little more board interaction during the early turns. 
the Soul Tide decks forego the Teferis and Board Wipes for more ramp spells and casualties of war, which can lead to devastating turns taking your opponent's best permanents off the battlefield. Each build has its strengths and weaknesses depending on their matchups, but ultimately, they're all looking to do the same thing. Ramp and win with expensive and powerful spells. If you run into this deck, do your best to shut the door before they hit 8 mana, or you're going to be looking across the table at an unstoppable threat. All right, I am here with Matt Sperling. And Matt, you have a, a really cool uh, little piece from your collection to share with us. What do you have for us? So my card is Sultanar the Swamp King. And Sweet. <laughs> from Legends, which is the latest set that was on shelves when I started playing in the summer of 94. Mm -hmm. So the set has a huge significance for me because it was one of the first boosters I ever bought. And really the first set that got me super excited about magic and kind of what's in the pack in front of you, but also what else could be out there. And Sulkinar was one of those cards that was somewhere else out there. I didn't own one in 94. I had kind of whatever my first couple of packs had, that's what I had. Mm -hmm. Eventually I heard about this card. And back then you would kind of, you would hear whispers and rumors of this card or that card existed. What, what was the Dak on Blackblade? What's the Sulkinar the Swamp King? Yeah. It wasn't until years later that I was able to own one and, when I when it was time to own one, I actually traded for this one that's signed and dated 1994. It kind of brings it front and center for me that this is from 1994. It's a, it's about that moment in time when I started playing, and it's a card I always wanted, and now I have. So it's a card that I look at and kind of think back about that time period I was just starting out. So what does it what does it mean to you when you when you look at the card now? Does it bring you back? Does it have a, a big nostalgia factor for you? Yeah, it kind of takes me out of the mindset of just, you know, the magic cards as a competitive player. They kind of, they, they're they're pieces on a board and they do what they do and they're kind of means to an end of winning a game of magic. Well, this card takes me out of that. And I remember how fun it was to just be collecting and thinking about which cards were out there and discovering new cards other than by reading, you know, a web page, but by actually like seeing someone play a card you've never seen before. It really does take me back to that place just by virtue of the fact that it's from that original set. It's so iconic. It bears that signature from 1994. It just takes me right back. Oh, that, that is super cool. And then I have to ask, have you ever had a chance to, to play the card in a deck or anything? I, <laughs> I don't know how good it is by today's standards, but have you ever got to play it? That's a very interesting question. Um, yes, I played it in oh. the 1993-1994 format, which is intentionally all about nostalgia and playing some of these older cards. And I built a Grixis deck in that format, played Gwendolyn de Courcy, played Sulkinar, and yes, it has seen some action in that format. So that's the oh, break out of the box that way. That makes me very happy. <laughs> that's really cool. Well, Matt, thanks so much for taking the time to share your story. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to coverage of the Players Tour Finals. And we have got round number 10 coming up here. And we are going to preview you it for you right now uh, as we head down, down the stretch towards our top eight. Take a look. We've got Christoph Prinz, our lone undefeated player, versus Riku Kumagai rocking that mono black aggro deck that I just love. Let's take a look, though, at the four color reclamation deck of Christoph Prinz, who's led him to this unblemished record so far. Cedric, tell me about this deck. Well, this is, uh, you know, I would say a classic Reclamation build, but it's got that splash for Teferi. That's the main splash here for the white. But don't forget about that lone copy of Dovin's Veto in the main deck, as well as that copy of Kenrith, the Return King. So the four-color Reclamation deck, the splash is for white. Teferi being, again, the key card there isn't bad against your aggressive strategies and actually is okay against this aggressive strategy in Mono Black Aggro. But again, these, these changes and these additions are purely for the Reclamation Mirror, and they can be okay in other places. As far as Mono Black Aggro is concerned, a unique build of the deck. Um, you're seeing Wrinkles here, you're seeing Spawn of Mayhems, all that good stuff. Uh, what you're not finding, unless my eyes do deceive me, is Rod and Regisaur. Not anywhere here. Instead, you're finding copies of Hunted Nightmare instead. Uh, and that one's a new one, but a good one that hasn't seen a ton of play. Throwing a couple of removal spells in Heartless Act, and I think this important discard spell here in three main deck copies of Duress, and you're finding a very unique take on Mono Black Aggro, but clearly one that's working. 
I cannot wait to see this match in action. But before we get there, we're going to take a look at our standings and find out where we're at in this tournament. Like I said, as we make our way towards the top eight coming up next weekend. Christoph Prince, like we said, the lone undefeated player rocking the field, leading things at 9-0. and oh. Cedric, what else stands out to you here? Well, if Corgan, again, I said at the top of the show and all weekend long is someone I'm going to be tracking because he has qualified for this tournament three different ways. He is currently in fourth place at 7-2. and two. A young kid, but a very, very good one who's really breaking out, I think, in this tournament. Seth Manfield, eh, I mean... What do you have to say there? <laughs> Seven and two. What would you expect? And then Michael Jacob with that Mardu Winota deck, again, playing a unique deck compared to what everybody else is doing here. And it's working just fine for MJ. He is seven and two and checking in at seventh place. Let's take a peek here at ninth through 16th. Riley, there's a guy, Raphael Levy in ninth. Very pleased to, uh, yeah, ride on Raph's coattails here. Uh, it's, it's good to uh, be catching up with him at the end of every round. I'm so pleased that he's doing so well for himself here. But, uh, you know, plenty of other European superstars in our top 16 as well. You can see Dominic Gertsen from Germany. You can see Pascal, uh, Pascal Vieren from uh, from Belgium there. And, of course, the Danish juggernaut himself, Christopher Larsen. It's good to see, once again, a very global tournament being played at all the far-flung corners of the, uh, of the, of the world. It's fantastic to see people from uh, from Asia, from the Americas, from Europe, all over the place coming together here. And you can see quite a uh, quite a range of nationalities here in uh, in our top 16. So you do really much. You do very much love to see. All right. Well, we've got round 10 on the way in just a minute. But before we get there, we're going to take a moment here to pause and remember part of our magic family, Angela Chandler former regional coordinator for the Southwestern USA Magic Judge Community. Angela was a positive force for cultural change, both in the judge community and the Southern California tournament scene. Her work focused on building ties between players and judges and making everyone feel welcome, and she will be missed. We're in the finals here of Mythic Championship 6. I'm Marshall Cycliffe with Paul Chion. Take a look at the trophy there as we work our way back into the future match area. And we've got two very, very good players playing very, very well in the finals. And of course, if you thought for one second that this was going to go to anything other than five games, you were wrong. We're in game number five. Is it, Apollo is has it Ether time? Gust, and he can it's just get time. that Krasis out of there. And that will actually allow him to attack on Andre's life total down to 13 while killing Oko. But I think this is pretty much all Apollo has. That was kind of it. Right? Strasky is still sitting at 13 life and he just has a questing beast that, that Strasky needs to deal with. Apollo is completely out of gas here. He has one card left in hand. It's a land. Can you imagine sitting in Andre Strasky's seat right now? He was staring down loss. In the last game, he fought his way all the way back to win it. And now he's playing against somebody that when he first met him, he literally said, you're my hero. Like, you're the person I watch on this very stream, and I want to be like you. And he's on the verge of beating him in the finals of a Mythic Championship. I mean, again, this is this is literally what you're dreaming about. And Andre Strosky wins Mythic <laughs> Championship 6. Congratulations, Andre. Oh my goodness, what a turnaround. I mean, I thought Paulo had it. I thought Paulo had it in game four. I did too. Unbelievable. He stuck right in there, never gave up, and found the right lines. Andre played so beautifully here in the finals and Absolutely. in the whole top eight. A well-earned victory for Mythic Championship 6 winner, Andre Strosky. Oh my goodness.